Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about methamphetamine and Adderall. What's the difference? So, starting with the take home, methamphetamine and amphetamine are two chemically distinct molecules. They do have different actions on receptors in the brain. They, they are similar, but there are also distinct differences. And in almost all cases that have been looked at, for all angles, methamphetamine is more dangerous, causes more problems, and probably is best to be avoided. So, to jump into it. Methamphetamine and amphetamine are chemically different molecules, so there is an extra methyl group, which is a carbon molecule with three hydrogens sticking off from it that's added on to the amphetamine molecule. And you might think that's just a subtle minor distinction, who cares? One of the previous um, talks I gave was about the difference within amphetamine. So just looking at, so these are structurally the same in terms of the same number of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, all the, the number of specific atom components are identical and in the same sequence and order, but looking at just mirror images, we know that there are measurable differences between dextroamphetamine and levoamphetamine. Um, so the addition of an additional carbon, not just the carbon atom, but the whole methyl moiety, carbon and three hydrogens, you know, you would expect could have a more substantial difference, and it does. Um, so again, to, I was disconcerted when I was doing research for this talk, and the first thing that came up when I was Googling differences between meth and Adderall or methamphetamine and amphetamine is about 15 different treatment sites had used that as a come on, or, and many of them just had factually incorrect information, including saying that methylphenidate or Ritalin was the same as meth. Um, it's not. So, so again, the significance of a carbon molecule can be huge. So ethanol, drinking alcohol, two carbon atoms and an OH alcohol group added on. Methanol, just different by one methyl group between so methanol is one carbon atom with the, hydrogen, with the alcohol moiety stuck on. Ethanol is you know, worldwide used for drinking and certainly has some potentially deleterious effects, but it's safe to drink. Methanol is a poison which will make you go blind if it doesn't kill you. It's used to make numbers of paints and solvents and plastics. It's used as a paint stripper. Um, so you do not want to be drinking methanol and saying, yeah, it's just one carbon molecule different than ethanol. Um, so what do, getting back to what stimulants do in the brain, um, they're acting on certain monoamine, which is um, dopamine, no, norepinephrine, serotonin, are the, the well-known monoamines used in the brain. There's a molecule called the trace amine-associated receptor that's involved in moving dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin around in the brain into and out of cells. Um, there's, and we know that the, there's a dopamine transporter. There's something called the vesicular monoamine transporter, which once these neurochemicals are within the cell, they're not just primarily floating willy-nilly within the nerve brain cells. They are sequestered into vesicles and there are specific molecules to help them get in and out of the mole, in and out of there. So some of the things that have been studied primarily in rodent models, um, but also in primate models, but in the laboratory, differences between methamphetamine and, and to say a little bit more, methamphetamine is also known by crack, by speed, by Crystal um, has a host of other street names. Um, so methamphetamine results in substantially more, probably five times as much release of dopamine at the neuro intrasynaptic level. It makes the dopamine that's released last longer. Um, 
the methamphetamine molecule, again, it's structurally different than the amphetamine molecule, has a substantial affinity for and potential to cause toxicity at serotonin neurons in the brain, which in at, at normal dosing levels or regular dosing levels, amphetamine is basically not messing with serotonin at all. The, dope, or the methamphetamine molecule is also what's called more lipophilic, which means it likes fat better, which means it slips into brain membranes, slips, enters the brain much more quickly. And because it may be binding more tightly to cellular membranes, it's probably harder to break down or dislodge in the end. So it does, so meth does tend to go in faster, last longer, and again, releasing substantially more dopamine and so, so that's what's happening at the neurochemical level. What we see at the behavioral and brain level is that that results in substantially higher rate of dependency and of addiction, much greater propensity to cause psychosis, much more likely to cause cardiac toxicity, um, much more likely to um, cause meth mouth. I mean, some people do have dry mouth from other stimulants, but not just dry mouth, but the combination of grinding teeth, dry mouth, and probably poor hygiene and behaviors creates a whole constellation of problems called net mouth, where people tend to lose their teeth are rotting and falling out quickly. Um, there's substantial evidence that meth abuse is a risk factor for Parkinson's the data looking at whether amphetamine itself has such a risk is much weaker and no substantial convincing data yet that shows there. And again, much more substantial data showing correlations or causation or implied causation of meth use and cognitive decline in people. Also in the laboratory situation, I mean, doses of amphetamines, particularly not too high a dose, but doses of amphetamines help promote focus, attention, concentration. Comparable doses of methamphetamine seem to be associated with not much enhancement in concentration and attention. And when looking at choices and risky behavior, um, at, at substantially lower doses or throughout the dosage range that have been tested, meth results in much more risky, much more risk taking, much more impulsive behavior, much more inability to discern what's a risky choice and what's a non risky choice. Some of that riskiness is there, an increased risk taking can be seen in some studies with amphetamine, not just meth but the magnitude is substantially higher and sort of the complete lack of discernment between what's risky and what's non-risky situation seems to be obliterated by meth. So um, clinically what we see among meth, I mean, it, it's particularly used for people who want to go on binges where it has both the euphoric effect and a sexual, it, it increases sexual desire often, but at the same time it decreases ability to ejaculate or reach climax in women, um, so it can sustain long bouts of sexual activity or, or performance. Um, again, it's much more prevalent, much more likely to be able to run into addiction problems. So one whole group of compounding factors, in addition to just chemical, neurochemical differences once a drug gets into the body, um, there also tend to be differences between how people are administering these drugs. So one difference is the route of administration. Um, there are certainly, so commonly with either Ritalin, again, which is not an amphetamine, but it's a related stimulant, um, either, but particularly amphetamine, the most common delivery route, even among people who are misusing it, seems to be ingesting, taking it in a pill form. You can grind it up, you can snort it, you can inject it, but with meth, the IV routes, the snorting, the inhaling, smoking it, crack, 
um, are far and away the preferred routes for it. And why that's so relevant is that, again, separate from what it's doing right at the neurochemical receptor, if it's getting in faster, if more is getting in, that's having an effect and all and that, that may potentiate or increase the likelihood of certain problems, including addiction, including tolerance from it. Um, so two, separate from just the route of administration, which can affect how quickly it gets in, the pattern of use has been shown with the stimulant medications to affect both the effect they are having and, and um, factors such as tolerance and other um, so specifically, what's common with meth use is binge use, where large amounts of time, large amounts are consumed over short periods of time. Then someone stops using, crashes, has withdrawal, and may not use for days or weeks. Um, so that pattern of use is associated with differences in the brain in terms of dopamine systems compared to every day taking it on a regular and moderate schedule. So separate from just how much is taken, separate from what they're doing once they get into the brain, the pattern of administration for stimulants is significant. So, and particularly differences in downregulation or alteration in dopamine receptors or dopamine transporters has been seen based on different patterns of delivery. And again, likelihoods of problems with addiction, problems with psychosis, all seem to be problems with excess of um, detrimental cognitive impairment seem to be higher with the binge pattern than with just regular dosing. And then the third compounding factor is that the social milieu surrounding the patterns of meth use tend to be substantially different than those. Again, there are people who could take meth on a regular, sustained, everyday dosing pattern and just ingest it in a pill form, but most aren't. But again, the whole surrounding range of factors of using of of that are commonly associated with meth use. I mean, so one greater use of other substances, poor hygiene, more disruption of sleep schedules, a whole host of other negative health factors may cloud and compound the toxicity of meth compared to Adderall. Um, so given that, and, and often the common assumption is, well, good, you know, that's why meth is only an illegal s street substance and Adderall is a controlled prescription medication. And that common assumption isn't actually right, that there is a prescription form of methamphetamine. It's called desoxin. Um, it's scheduled the same as a Schedule II substance, same degree of security or, or restrictions as, as amphetamine and others, um, classic stimulants, Ritalin family drugs. And it was actually, I, a couple of years ago, um, Tom Cruise, I think it was when he was being interviewed with Oprah, was, and he's dissed traditional mental health treatment and specifically just condemned both antidepressant use and stimulant use. And he condemned, you know, all that these drugs were used by the Germans in World War II. And I think in the talk he was, he, said it was Adderall, but it was actually methamphetamine. It wasn't amphetamine itself that the Germans used at a wide scale in the very first few years of the World War II, 38, 39, 40, but they saw so many, and it, it was effective in keeping their soldiers awake. It was probably helping them to be more aggressive, but there were too many problems with psychotic reactions, excessive violence, and people crashing and needing several days of recovery after binging or using it. So the Germans did a phase that out in 40 or 41, but again, disoxin, methyl, um, and methamphetamine is still available as a prescription substance. 
also a little more numerically the the extent of the meth epidemic and other stimulant epidemic is not yet as large I mean, it's it's only about a quarter the size of the opioid epidemic but interestingly of people who are prescribed prescription stimulants um sorry people who are prescribed prescription painkillers opioid painkillers um, by official cdc and other groups that monitor these somewhere in 10 to 12 percent of people on the prescription painkillers opioid painkillers wind up abusing misusing running into potential addiction problems so all misuse and abuse doesn't equate to addiction but it's in the range of 10 12 percent with people who are prescribed stimulants the study suggests closer to 30 percent almost a third of people wind up misusing and using that does not mean again full addiction with stimulant use but stimulants look inherently like a substantially riskier and again there may be certainly social factors contributing to that but it probably is at least somewhat neurochemical on how they're working and the likelihood of, of um, being feeling rewarding feeling encouraging their own use is, is inherently higher with stimulants <coughs> than with the opioid painkillers so traditionally or at least I should say historically in this country and I believe in Western Europe as well following opioid epidemics we tend to follow those with stimulant epidemics um, I've written about this more than two three years ago when and others as well and we are continuing to see a substantial increase in the use of stimulants while our opioid use is declining um, so we need to be more vigilant about that and particularly um, although we have some effective strategies for treating both behaviorally psychologically treatments and and some medication based treatments for the stimulants we do not yet have any substantially verified neurochemical medication approaches that look powerful one of the approaches that has been studied on and off um, which doesn't seem that helpful so just as other less harmful opioids or some that are partially blocking some of the receptor systems so both methadone and buprenorphine are used and effectively can treat opioid addictions people have looked at whether amphetamine or Ritalin could be used to effectively treat methamphetamine abuse and most of the small number of studies that have been done show that it doesn't have much impact people keep using their meth probably again because it's more rewarding it's giving them a bigger boost it's more fun it, it's just not effectively blocked enough by someone being daily treated with Adderall um, amphetamine or methylphenidate Ritalin doesn't block meth use um, there have been trials of studies in San Francisco here a few years ago there's moderate amount of publicity for using mirtazapine remeron and that study do, did seem to be effective there has not been widespread replication yet and it certainly wasn't a panacea that everyone stopped abruptly and most often these medication trials are used in conjunction with some forms of talking therapy contingency based you know, that if you have these consequences if you you use drugs and you're in our program and trying to use healthy rewards instead of using drug rewards so that's about all I have to say about meth versus Adderall except I would certainly advise anyone I know to avoid meth. Next week's topic is drug holidays, specifically for stimulants. Do they do any good? And that's all for today.